Mr. Nathan either. Oh, no, he's freaking out. Oh, Josh. 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 Okay, I think there is a lot to unpack here. Hi everyone, Azot here and welcome to my channel. Over the past few weeks, Pokemon released lots of trailers revealing plenty of new information about the upcoming new games. Today I'm going to focus on what's new in Pokemon Legend Arceus and with further ado, I think we can start by talking about the first trailer released on September 28. The trailer starts off with this scene where we get to see a bunch of Pokemon interacting with the environment. Here we can see a Drifloon disappearing when approached, and as it is for every game in the series, certain Pokemon like Drifloon of course, will show up only at a certain time of the day. Then we see the player playing a flute, a mysterious instrument which has the power to summon the readable Pokemon of the region. We're going to access this function by pressing the plus button, and by pressing the directional buttons we'll be able to change the mount. Then when we hear the flute makes the exact sound of the Azure Flute, a key item that can be only used at Spear Pillar in the original Gen 4 Pokemon games. If played, the Azure Flute will trigger an in-game event that will allow the player to enter the Hall of Origin, where the mythical Arceus resides. From the official website we learn this flute is called Celestica Flute. The name clearly comes from Celestic Town, cultural and spiritual center and oldest town in Sinnoh, said to have been there since the region itself was created. All sites on the internet, but the official one, report that the flute is passed down through generation of the Swiss people. And this is a bit strange because the official site states that during your adventure you receive a Celestica flute. Are we supposed to inherit this item, or the flute will be simply handed over to us? Are there more Celestica flutes? Are we natives of the Hisui region? I think we are, and it is highly possible that we will inherit the flute during a ritual or some sort of that. The flute has the power to soothe the Pokemon minds. As we can see from this frame here, Basco Legion needs to hear us play the flute in order to trust us, and this is a very important detail. For this reason, it is obvious to think that the flute is, in some way, connected with Arceus and that is imbued with its power as it can control all Pokemon minds in the region. Then we see a few images of world exploration, and as it is stated by the official website, both Weirdir and Basco Legion can leap to avoid obstacles in the way and let us throw Pokeballs in the process. Weirdir can also dash to give us a speed boost while exploring the region, and soaring the sky with bravery will allow us to spot all those points of interest, Pokemon, items, and as I said in my first video, not confirm with the shoot or deposits that might be below. However, we don't know who the Clamber Pokemon is yet. Leakers say it is the Suyan evolution of Sneasel. Guess we have to wait a little bit longer for that. In Jubilife Village, there are a lot of shops where we can buy items and replenish our supplies. Charon's ancestor is the owner of the general store where we can buy berries and ingredients. We can also buy crafting recipes and materials from the craftworks and craft things ourselves with the workbench in the front of the shop. In this new trailer, we see that potions now restore a whooping 60 points of a Pokemon HP and can be crafted with an orange berry and a medicinal lick. It also seems that I was right about the limited space in our bag, as the screen here shows only 20 spaces available. Next, Darak's ancestor is the owner of the clothes shop. Here we can buy kimonos, suits, hats and even masks. The interface is a carbon copy of the one we've seen in Sword and Shield. Nice, clean and intuitive. Unfortunately though, it seems that there isn't an option to change the colors of our clothes, as I assumed in my last video. Ah oh well, never mind. Then we come to Pastors, the box system for this game. To complete the first Pokédex of the region, we'll need to capture lots of Pokémon, and as it was for all the other Pokémon games, we can carry a maximum of 6 in our party at a time. As stated by the official site, we'll have to choose the Pokémon we want to carry with us before heading out on a survey. I don't know at this moment if Pastors will have mobile features like it was for the box system in Let's Go and Sword and Shield, but I hope he'll do. Anyway, this pester frame looks stunning, and seeing Game Freak finally using the HD 3D models in boxes is a complete breath of fresh air. You can't understand how happy I am. Goodbye reuse sprites! 
From the Pokemon details tab on the right, we can see that all things are pretty similar to old games, except for the trainer, now called partner, and the symbol for this game, which is Arceus Ring. Then, next to the Pokemon stats, we can see a symbol with a closed fist and some number on top of it. I assume these values will increase for a maximum of 10, as this circle can be divided in 5 equal sections. We don't know what these values are, but I think they are somehow related to strong and agile style moves. Personally, I don't think they're visible EVs or IVs values. The progression wheel is way too little for them to be, but let me know your opinions in the comment section below. What do you think these values are? Then, you may have already noticed this, but some information is missing. I'm talking about Pokemon Natures, Abilities and the tool that allows the player to move items inside boxes. This image here confirms the fact that Pokemon can hold items in and outside battles. But what about Abilities? As I said, it seems that in Pokemon Legends Arceus, Pokemon will not have Abilities, as neither the trailers nor the official website ever mentioned them. I'm not sure about Pokemon nature, but it's a possibility to take into account. Then, let's talk about the scroll symbol found next to the Pokemon moves. Every move has this symbol, except for extrasensory. Okay, this is interesting. At first, my thought was that priority moves like Aqua Jet and powerful statue moves like Sword Dance wouldn't be possible to be turned into strong or agile moves, but I was mistaken. As we can see from the first trailer, Oshawott's Aqua Jet and Sword Dance don't have the symbol, but in the fight against Cleaver, they do, and this is a problem. Let's think about it. Giving a priority bonus to a priority move like Aqua Jet with Agile Style will let the user attack infinite times before the opponent even responds. Now imagine using the Agile Style with Sword Dance. The user increases its attack stat, and then the priority boost will let it attack immediately after for at least two turns in a row. Yes, not quite that balanced. In this case, Extrasensory is a move that inflicts damage and has a 10% chance of causing the target to flinch. If used with Agile Style, it is highly possible it will create an infinite loop like Serene Grace Jirachi with Iron Head. I know, the move in the trailer doesn't have the symbol, but as I said, it seems that every move can be used in both style, with no exception for Extrasensory. For now, we just have to wait and see what will happen in the future, but I'm quite uncertain. I place my hopes in you, Game Freak. Let the combat system be balanced. I beseech you. Another cool thing to notice is that Pokemon stats have been increased by a lot. A normal Drift Blim will never reach such high stats, not even with maxed IVs, maxed AVs and perfect nature. It is simply impossible. The reason for all of this is that Game Freak had to do it. With the introduction of strong and agile style moves, we need to have Pokemon that resist multiple attacks and increasing Pokemon stats is a simple and effective way to work around this problem. Then, a new form of the Alola Photo Club feature returns in Pokemon Legends Arceus. In the Hisu region, photography is in its early days been this game based on our world's second half of the 19th century. The photography studio, in fact, is furnished with the same elements and objects we will find in a place of the time. I'm talking about the white background and the classic mirrors used to reflect the light. As it was in the Alola Photo Club, here we can take pictures with our Pokémon, strike different poses and faces, add elements like chairs and change the backgrounds to set up the perfect photo. I truly hope we will be able to edit them later with frames and stickers. It will be so cool. I think the photography studio won't replace the card maker feature we found in Sword and Shield, which I love so much, but it will contextualize this feature to the time period of the game, if that makes sense. Then we meet a bunch of new people. These characters are once again ancestors of existing characters in the modern day Pokemon world. They are called Wardens, but who are they and what are their tasks? We immediately meet Mei, the ancestor of Marley from the Gen 4 games. In this game, however, she is followed by her partner Manchalax, who grew up with her as if it were siblings. She is said to care for a special weirdier found in the Obsidian Fieldlands. These special Pokémon are known as Nobles and have received a mysterious blessing, probably from Arceus. Some of them are particularly powerful, while some others willingly assist the people of the region. Encountering this noble Pokémon will be a key part of the story of the game. It is said that the people of the Hisui region hold a great respect for this Pokémon and have tasked talented people like Mei to look after them. 
Wardens protect the territories where these special Pokémon live and provide them with offerings of their favorite foods and water. Providing gods with food and other materials is a common practice that can be found all over the world. In the history of humanity, people have always made offerings to their gods in order to grant protection and good fortune. So it is right to assume that natives of the Hisu region venerate Pokémon as if they are divine beings, exactly as it was for the Ainu people in Hokkaido. We can clearly feel a strong religious bond between natives and Pokémon, Wardens are grateful to Pokémon, even submitted to them. Next we meet Iskan, a Warden that lives in a tent by the sea. He cares for a special Basculigion, is easily frightened and doesn't seem fond of ghost types. Which is funny because Basculigion is half ghost type. Unlike the other two Wardens, he doesn't seem to be an ancestor of an old character. As a matter of fact, I didn't notice any striking resemblance to anyone in the Pokémon world, so let me know if you did. Next we meet Warden Lian. Clearly he is the ancestor of gym leader Clay from the Unova region. He wears the same hat and the two share the same hairstyle. With all these references from different generations, the Pokémon world is feeling more and more connected and I really love it. Maybe Pokémon Legends Arceus was designed to be a big celebration of the Pokémon franchise, especially knowing that this year Pokémon celebrated its 25th anniversary. Anyway, Warden Lian is a young lad said to be very talented. He cares for the new Pokémon Cleaver, the Lord of Obsidian Fieldlands, Bug and Rock type, issuing an evolution of Scyther, result of this being exposed to some unique minerals found in the region. There is so much to say about Cleaver and its battle, but I will do it later in its own dedicated chapter. For now, let's simply move on to the last Warden, Arezu, who everyone believes to be the ancestor of Commander Mars of Team Galactic. She's a bit loud, but very friendly. She feels very responsible for her position and tends to do things all by herself. She is tasked with the care of a quote certain lady Pokemon and I think I know who the lady Pokemon is but I reveal my theory a bit later on. It is stated by the official website that some wardens will challenge us to a battle and some others won't. But in the case of May, she will send her partner Munchlax into a fight to ensure if you are worthy enough for Weirdier. An important thing to notice is that even for natives like May, it is still considered strange to live alongside Pokemon like she does, and it's even rarer to see people lead their Pokemon in a battle. In these shoots we see Warden May taunting us, saying if we feel confident leading our Pokémon in a battle and tell us she doesn't need our stupid balls to bond with Pokémon because her partner Munchlax decided to do it by itself. And this is huge. We are witnessing the ideological collision between the natives and the Galaxy Expedition team members. Tradition over innovation, technology against religion. The first worship Pokémon as if they're gods and care for them by bringing offering of food and water while the latter think Pokémon are nothing more than mere objects of study, terrifying beasts to be afraid of. It is pretty evident the fact that something dark is moving in the Hisu region, and I bet the Galaxy Expedition team is involved in some way or another. The first thing I thought after reading these lines is that we have always considered catching Pokémon to be an urban thing, but evidently it hasn't always been. As things stand today, we can say the Galaxy Expedition team ideology prevailed over the one of the natives. All of a sudden, Team Plasma doesn't seem so evil, right? As you may have noticed, Game Freak has put a lot of effort into details like this. This level of attention and immersion amazed me beyond measure. How strange, did I really say Game Freak managed to do a good thing? Oh my, what a strange world we live in. Speaking of details, we can observe that Wardens wear wooden bracelets adorned with carvings of the feature of the special Pokémon they care for. Mace bracelet has Weirdir's face on it, Lian's bracelet has Cleaver's. On Iskan's bracelet is visible only the tip of Basculigion's tail, and for Arezu's bracelet there is no way to tell directly who the Pokémon is, since it was willingly hidden from us in all the trailers and in the official illustration. There is a big but though. All the bracelets are colored with the main colors of the special Pokémon they depict. White for May's bracelet, brown for Lia's one, Basculigion's greens for the one of Iskan, and a softer green for Arezu's bracelet. We could speculate this color to be representing a bug or a grass-type Pokémon, but for me, she will probably turn out to be the Warden who cares for Isuan Zoroark. 
In fact, the official website states that Arezu cares for a certain lady Pokémon. I may be wrong, of course, but to me, Hisui and Zoroark seem to have strong feminine features. I'm talking about its general look, the facial details that resemble makeup, and the fact that it protects Hisui and Zorua like a mother would do with its cub. My initial thought was that Mei and the other Wardens may care for multiple Pokémon at a time. I say this because her hair clip resembles the white and red fur tufts of Hisui and Zoroark. So, if the Wardens are going to take the place of modern-day gym leaders, I think there will be at least 8 of them, even 10. If you noticed, Warden May and Leon reside in the same macro area of the game. I think we have to expect 2 Wardens for every macro area of the region, and this brings the number to at least 10, without counting the possible additional ones scattered in other locations such as the top of Mount Coronet. I don't know, I think I got it, but I'm not 100% sure. Folks, tell me how many do you think there are going to be, I would love to know. The last thing to mention about Wardens are their clothing, which have the same colors of the Alga and Palkia and most of all they display the symbol of the diamond and of the pearl on their chest. You can also see Palkia's ridge on Leon's hood and the two horns of Dialga on the other Wardens hood as well. These clothes belong to the two tribes of natives that live within the region. You can see them on the map and from the Spanish trailer we know that they are called the Diamond and the Pearl Clan. To me, it is like the two tribes seem to know very well the two legendary Pokémon the Arg and Palkia. Even if Eterna City statue doesn't exist yet, the fresco on Celestic Ruins front wall surely does. After all, Celestic Town has been here since Sinnoh itself was created. Everything seems to lead to this conclusion, but I think people don't really know how Palk and Dialga truly are. I say this because of the statues we can find on top of Cleaver's banners in the Grand Tree Arena. At first, I thought of a new regional form of Gible, but then I remembered Garchomp as not one in this game. Then I saw the pearl and the diamond symbol hanging from the banners. Without any doubt, these statues resemble the two Pokémon Palk and Dialga as the two tribes conceived them from the myths and legends. During our explorations in the Hisui region, we ran into rampaging berserk Pokémon called the Alphas. They grow larger compared to their normal counterparts, have red glowing eyes and will chase us down and attack us as soon as they notice us. As much as it is with real-life animals, Alpha are the leaders of a group of Pokémon and appear to be very strong. In the trailer we are shown a failed stealth approach attempted by the player who's trying to make his way through a snowy lane where there are a couple of Electabuzz and an Alpha Electrivire. Once the player has been noticed by the Alpha, the stealth meter bar will turn red and temporarily we won't be able to access the functions of the Pokeride. At this moment, Electivire will attack us and call the other two Pokémon to join the fight, in a similar way as it was in Pokémon Sun and Moon with Pokémon calling for help in battle. I am a little bit confused though. How are we supposed to fight three Pokémon at once? Unfortunately, there isn't much to say here as we don't know anything at the moment. Again, my hopes lie in Game Freak, trusting that they will be able to balance everything properly, also because it seems that Alpha can use strong and agile style moves too. Despite being tough opponents, Alpha will become great allies if we manage to defeat and catch them. They may even drop rare items after fighting against us. This reminds me a lot of Pokémon Sword and Shield Dynamax battles. Think of it, both Alphas and Dynamax Pokémon are powerful giants with great stats that once defeated will drop rare items. It also reminds me of Zelda Breath of the Wild. In Hyrule we can find a lot of optional mini-bosses that will drop a lot of good items if defeated. I think this is a great way for Pokémon to finally become the RPG it always wanted to be, and I hope Alphas will give us a great challenge. Next, in this frame here, we got to see Warden Leon under the huge tree in the Obsidian Fieldlands, the Grand Tree Arena. He says that not even he can get closer to Cleaver, especially because at the moment the Pokémon is rampaging and destroying everything in its path. Before talking about it, there is another thing I'd like to discuss with you. In this screenshot we see Warden Arezu, by the way in the same place we find Warden Leon, saying that she'd really like to know all the things we learned from joining the Galaxy Expedition team, and seems a little bit jealous of us, but not in a mean way. In fact, she seems to admire us. 
Perhaps her desire for knowledge will lead her to join the Galaxy Expedition team, and possibly she will renounce her title of Warden 2. It is also highly possible she will give important information about noble Pokémon to the Galaxy team, starting a conflict between natives and colonizers. This would explain why we find her descendant Mars in Team Galactic in Pokémon Diamond, Pearl and Platinum. To get back to what we were talking about, a strange phenomenon is causing nobles to get frenzied, making them incredibly difficult to rein in, even for wardens, and we as members of the Survey Corps will be called upon to try to quell this Pokémon. Here's Cleaver, the Lord of the Woods, the Isuian evolution of Scyther, Bug and Rock type. It is said that special minerals found in the Hisu region cause Scyther to evolve. Its body made of stone often get chipped during battle, making its stone part sharper, increasing its slicing abilities. People of Isui once used the pieces of stone that have fallen from Cleaver to craft tools. It attacks with its axe-like arms, which are set to deliver devastating blows that deal massive damage even to the hardiest opponents. Cleaver is one of many nobles we're going to find in the Hisu region. In its debut, it clearly appears corrupted and overflowing with power. This mysterious power makes it grow larger and makes its whole body glow brightly. Cool thing to notice is that the golden ring aura around its body resembles the one of Arceus, so it is obvious the mythical Pokémon is involved, as we've seen in the first trailer. Anyway, defeating Cleaver in a battle won't quell it. To do that, we'll have to eat it with bombs made with its favorite foods. In this case, we're going to use forest bombs, the ones seen in the screenshot with Warden Arezu. The battle is divided in two four stages. In all of them, we have to dodge Cleaver's attacks, which are a wide frontal stone edge attack, a wide range circular swirl, and a frontal charge preceded with a bright glare in its eyes. We'll have to send out our Pokémon and deal some damage to the Noble the moment we'll see the right opportunity to do so. Defeating the Noble in a battle will make it temporarily dazed and more vulnerable to forest bombs that, in this instance, will cause a great amount of damage. It is important to notice that when Cleaver is protecting itself, the Balms will be less powerful than normal, so if we want the Balms to have a major effect, we'll have to wait for the right moment. To defeat Cleaver, we'll have to repeat this process four times, but surely the difficulty of each stage will increase. The Noble Pokémon will most likely start attacking more frequently and inflict more damage. In addition to Oshawott's execution, we can see the last of the three matchup symbols, which marks super effective moves with a circle and a little dot in the center. And now it's finally time to talk about the infamous Arc Phone. Sure. Given the fact that there is a phone in a Pokémon game set in a time period where technology is in its early days, is rather odd. Anyway, this device looks distinctly similar to Arceus, and, as mentioned by the website, we received the Arc Phone early on our adventure, even if, from these frames, it seems that we'll find it on the ground instead. The Arc Phone will be very useful during our exploration. Similar to the Shaker Slate from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, this device contains the region's map and lists our current active missions and requests. This screenshot of Obsidian Feedlands confirms the fact that this game won't be an open world. In fact, to enter or exit this huge area, we have to take this path north marked with this tunnel symbol. As Sword and Shield's wild area, Obsidian Fieldlands and presumably all the other macro areas as well are divided into little sub areas. And now that I see it, it is crazy to think how many things Janet is about this game. Moving on, Deer Track Height might be the location where we first saw Weird Deer in the trailer and the location where we have to complete our trial to be considered worthy to ride it. Ground Tree Arena is marked with the active mission symbol, but the game won't let us fly directly there. It seems that we'll be able to fast travel only to location with this blue symbol that depicts a tent and a plume, as it is in Zelda Breath of the Wild with watchtowers. Probably these locations are the Warden stands we've seen in the trailer, or again Survey Corps base camps in which the player can rest and craft items. As we progress through the game and complete trials to ride noble Pokémon, what musical note symbols will unlock and mark on the map important location for the plot? Then we can see discovered locations display their names on the map. They are marked with a pin-like symbol and are clearer than all the others in the area. 
Also, from the map screen, we can observe the fact that the weather extends to the whole obsidian fieldlands, so we won't see any terrible weather transition like the ones in Sword and Shield. Nice! At last, we'll be able to put pins and stamps all over the map to remember the locations of previously found berry or apricorn trees, or deposits, or alpha Pokémon we want to battle again. But, did you really think that I forget to mention the most important thing about the Arc Phone? As stated by the official website, this device appears to contain some sort of strange power, and it seems it will help you guide on your journey. Ok, this is the part of the video where I blow your mind with an improbable theory. I hope you're ready. Do you remember Alpha Pokémon? There is one cool thing about them, and that's their name. Arceus is known to be the Alpha Pokémon, a reference to the first letter of the Greek alphabet, an important symbol in human history. Like I said, besides being a letter, Alpha is also a religious symbol, especially in Christianity, where it represents the beginning and is always combined with Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, its opposite. Alpha and Omega are the beginning and the end, in one word, God. More to that, Alpha and Omega are also the symbols that represent Azov, the universal cure, the elixir of life, so desperately sought by alchemists. In addition, Azov is said to contain all the information of the universe, being the material embodiment of God. Therefore, Arceus is Azov, the ultimate perfect being. Like Alphas, noble Pokémon grow in size too. Could Dynamax Energy and or Arceus have something to do with this? Could the power of Eternatus be equal to that of Arceus? As we have seen in Sword and Shield, Dynamax Energy causes Pokémon to grow giant and go on a rampage. A similar phenomenon is happening in Pokémon Legends Arceus. Some days ago, Kayatsu tweeted this image. This is a screenshot of the Legends Arceus official download card. Arceus here is glowing brightly without its ring. Immediately, one thing struck me. What if the ring can be removed from its body? What if the ring has the same function of Type Null's control masks? They are both pretty similar in their appearance after all. As you might already know, Type Null, codenamed Beast Killer, is a Pokémon created by Faba of the Aether Foundation in the Alola region, using cells from every known Pokémon type to specifically fight against the Ultra Beasts. This was done to give Type Null an artificial ability, developed by the same foundation, that allowed this Pokémon to shift between types by holding a corresponding memory, just as Arceus' ability with elemental plates. Three Type Null were created, but all three rejected this ability, called Arceus System. Arceus, Arceus system, and went berserk. Once subdued, the three creatures were given control helmets, and the whole project was deemed a failure. In addition, when Type Null evolves into Silvalli, it breaks its control mask, revealing its true and stronger form. As it is for Type Null, in Pokémon Legends Arceus, the mythical Pokémon will remove its control ring to reveal its true form, probably its Eternamax form. Having said that, could Eternamax Eternatus be a godlike creature as Arceus is? I am just speculating here, but did you notice how strange Eternatus is? Even for being a legendary Pokémon, it is far too strange. To make it short, I think Eternatus is a scrapped Ultra Beast from Gen 7 that has been reused in Pokémon Sword and Shield. As it is stated in its Shield's Pokédex entry, Eternatus crashed into Galar inside a meteorite that fell 20,000 years ago. But is this true? As far as we know, Eternatus may even have been sent from somewhere else using a Ultra Wormhole, an unstable space-time duct that connects the Pokémon world and Ultra Space. In Pokémon Sun and Moon, Ultra Beasts enter the Alola region thanks to a multitude of Ultra Wormholes opened by Lusamine, the head of the Aether Foundation, who forced Nebby the Cosmog to open them all across the region. In Pokémon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, the prison Pokémon Necrozma opened multiple Ultra Wormholes across the region after fusing with Solgaleo or Lunala. It is highly possible one of these wormholes reached the prehistoric Galar region and released the gigantic Pokémon Eternatus. In the same way, a Solgaleo and a Lunala, and then all the Dynamax, the Legendaries and Ultra Beasts, managed to arrive at the Max Lair in the Crown Tundra 20,000 years later. 
Even people can travel through these wormholes, but if not protected with an ultra space suit, the traveler will lose all his or her memories becoming a faller. It is the case of Annabelle, Salon Maiden in the Gen 3 games and Tower Tycoon in the Gen 4 games. She was found unconscious on a beach in Alola by Luker and Nanu. She was only able to tell them her name, that she came from the Owen region, that she protected a tower and that she was a powerful trainer there. The international police detected incredible amounts of ultra warm energy coming from her body and found out she was a faller who was lost in a wormhole for a long time. Even Luker seems to have been a faller. He appears in Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire in the Battle Resort. Like Annabelle, he lost his memories and all he remembers is waking up on the beach. The reasons were unknown at the time, as this event was much more of a teaser for the plot of Pokémon Sun and Moon. So now we know that Fallers are imbued with ultra wormhole energy and emit this power from their bodies. Ultra Beasts mistake this energy for ultra wormholes, causing them to pursue Fallers under the false impression that they are the way back for their dimension. As Fallers, the Archfawn is imbued with a strange power too, and it is said that it will guide us on our journey. Do you see the connection here? Heather Foundation is one of the few groups of people in the Pokemon world to know Arceus' aspect and nature, as they studied the myth involving the mythical being and created a living creature made on its image. The other people who know Arceus and the secret projects of the Heather Foundation are Rose and Olive of the Macrocosmos. After completing the main story in Sword and Shield, we will be given a Type Null by an employee at the Battle Tower. But what is it doing here? As always, the answer lies in its Pokédex entry. Macrocosmos robbed the Aether Foundation of important research files, including the files on the Beast Killer project, and created a new type null. But why? As I said before, it is because, in my opinion, Eternatus is in reality an Ultra Beast. When Rose found Eternatus, sleeping deep in its slumber under the city of Hammerlock, the first thing he thought of was a way to protect the region from that frightening mysterious creature. It is likely that, during the study of this creature, Rose and Olive learn about the Heather Foundation and their wrongdoings in the Alola region. Comparing the research projects with those of the Heather Foundation, they noticed that the coincidences were too many, so they created their first beast killer. But in the end they did nothing about it and Type Null proved to be useless even to their cause. A very cool trivia fact to point out, which very few people noticed, is the reason why Rose and all Macrocosmos employees have full teams of Steel-type Pokémon. As most of you know, the Steel-type is the only one that resists Dragon-type moves and that is completely immune to Poison ones, which are exactly the types of Eternatus. With all of that being said, it's likely that the Archfawn was created by the Aether Foundation and sent from the Alola region through an Ultra Wormhole. More to that, the colors used for the Wall Aether Foundation and for the clothes of the members are the same as Arceus, so basically I win. And that's it folks, as always I had a lot of fun theorizing about the new things Pokemon showed us and I really thank you all for watching this and my previous video. For those who didn't, I hope you'll consider watching it and while you're at it, leave a like and a comment. It would help me a great deal. Now, tell me, did you like this theory? Let me know in the comment section below. But what do I think about the game at this point? To be clear with you, Pokemon Legends Arceus is the Pokemon game I always wanted, but in my opinion, it looks horrible. I'm not talking about the game as a whole, I'm talking about its visuals, which are anachronistic to say the least. Environments are muddy and full of blurry textures. They appear as they haven't fully rendered and my dear Lord Arceus, they are barren as wastelands. Human and Pokemon models are okay, nothing more than we've seen in Sword and Shield. Don't even get me started on legs and frame rate drops. As everyone else, I hope Game Freak will polish and refine this game because, as I said, this is a dream come true. Okay, now I think I said everything I got. Subscribe to this channel if you want and follow me on Twitter, the link is everywhere. That's all for now, see you next time, bye!